us tonight. I appreciate you. I appreciate this church. Thank you for all your praying, for all your commitment. Hopefully we're coming to the end of something, the beginning of something. Remember this Wednesday night, God willing, we'll meet together for uh, some little bit of quick Bible study and we'll do some foot washing and some communion. And uh, it's kind of an annual thing with our church. And I think we're supposed to do it. The Lord taught us to do it. I don't think anybody's got any dirty feet. I just think that sometimes we might have dirty spirits. We might have a need of becoming servants. The highest criteria that I can find in the kingdom of God is the attitude of a child and a servant. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a servant. I want to please God. I want to, I want to please God. Amen. Thank you again for coming tonight. The gentleman I'm bringing to the pulpit has been here before, Brother Carl Shirty, him and his sweetheart, pastored a fantastic church for many, many years in Louisiana, and then they decided to just walk away, turn it over to somebody else, his boy pastors down here in the state of Florida, and he was coming through for this weekend, and I said, why not preach? So he's coming to bless us. Why don't you give him a warm welcome to the call center. Three of the greatest words in the Pentecostal movement is, you may be forward, be seated. I'll make friends start off with it is so good so good to be back and brother brother uh, uh, Arnold, brother Arnold. I, I was trying to think Arnold and Palmer came up I don't know why that happened but you got it. Oh my goodness, I can tell right now that you folks, I, I was visiting in a church this morning. We had a great move of God and miracles, visible. And uh, in the beginning of the service, they uh, took up a happy offering. I've never, I've never done that. I had to wait and watch and see what they were doing. And so when they got their money out, they had some kids that come up and took their money. Then they had to give a testimony of why they were happy. You know, and I liked it. I, I did. I gave some money and told them why I was happy. That's right. Because I am. Now, I told them this, and I, I, I found this out a long time ago. There's a difference in your joy and your happiness. There's a difference. Now, the devil can mess with your happiness. He has made me unhappy a lot. Right. And, uh, I, I think I stay happy the most, but I'm just, I'm thankful that he can't mess with my joy. Aren't you? Praise God. And that's, that's what I feel here tonight with you folks, everybody. You know, it, uh, I, I thought sitting over there a moment ago, the Apostle Paul uh, went off preaching in, uh, in the course of his travels. He was telling everybody that he met about the church at Achaia. You know, everybody was hearing about the church at Achaia. And of course, Paul was saying the church at Achaia is ready. That was his message about the church at Achaia. And of course, he was talking about their giving. And, and of course, that's uh, one of the places that Ministry of Saints was, was advocated. And, and uh, Paul said, I have been telling everybody that you are ready. Now, I guess you could take that part that they were ready and go a dozen different ways with it. Ready for what? But anyhow, Paul said, I went to Macedonia and I told him that you folks were ready. They all decided to send a group down there and find out. <laughs> so that's the way I feel about Gainesville. Every once in a while, people need to come find out for themselves that this is a happy church. Is that all right? Amen. I think you're ready. I do. I believe this church is ready. That statement of the church being ready is kind of like God told Moses. He said, I am. So you finish the rest of it. I'm not sure what all you're ready for, but I just believe you're ready. 
and I do appreciate so much the atmosphere here tonight. My wife and I, are, we look so much forward to being back here in Gainesville with you, Brother Arnold and I. Uh, you know, I, I have a few friends around the country that we can just, we can talk about preaching. You know, uh, not about uh, uh, something that you like. Uh, I don't play golf, so I can't talk about my golf score. And uh, in fact, at this stage of my life, I don't play anything. <laughs> Praise God. Everything is serious right now. And uh, uh, anyhow, you know, just uh, uh, to pick up the phone and, and, and say, and I do this, I say, look, I called you because I want to know, have you been hearing anything from God lately? Uh, it, that's where it is. What have you been hearing? I remember a few years ago, you might remember that, Brother James Kilgore uh, spoke in the day service at General Conference, and he was weeping. I don't mean he was just, you know, about to cry. Tears were running down his face and dropping off of his chin. And Brother, Brother Kilgore said, I called all my friends, and I asked them what they had heard from God lately. And he said, now, Brother James Kilgore had a pretty high level uh, friendship and he said I call my friend he said this a general conference he put it they had it on on uh, BBD and all of that and he said none of my friends are hearing anything from God that's what he said I, I sit there I, I was the only one the whole family had gone off doing something and I sit there and I wept and I thought how many of our preachers are still hearing from God Hallelujah. Still hearing from God. Now, God's still speaking. He never quits talking. He's, he's speaking all the time. We just got to tune in to that frequency where God's talking to us. Praise God. We do love your pastor and his wife more than I'll even try to stand here and tell you. And uh, I, I don't... And, and I thought about this driving over here this evening. I, I don't just love Brother Arnold because he is Brother Jeff Arnold and he has done this or that or whatever. The thing that captivated me the first time that I heard Brother Arnold preach, I knew instantly that he was a man who sought God. And if we don't learn how to pursue God, we're going to miss the whole life. We have a world full of, of orators today that are good. They're better than me. And they're a whole lot smoother than Brother Arnold is. You know, you know very classy type. Brother Arnold's not a classy type guy. He, you know, uh, praise God. But I'll tell you one thing. Every time I've ever heard him open his mouth, there was authority and power and anointing. And what he had to say, praise God. So the Lord is... Amen. Amen. And there is none like Him. None. Let me read you a portion of an old story tonight in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. And some of you already know what it's all about. So let the dry bone she had just right. Praise God. You would think that as much time as I've had and me being in Gainesville and all of that, that I could come up with a little bit better than Ezekiel's bones because we have wore it out, preached about it. <laughs> Let me share this with you. And I want you to listen very carefully. All of a sudden, this book is coming to life. And stuff that we've just used, all of a sudden we find out that God had a reason. That there was a purpose for incidents and things that took place, who was involved, where it took place, and, and how it happened. All of that, there's a purpose. All my life I've never been content to just know something happened. I want to know why. Amen. And that has been one of the greatest 
things of my life. But let's take a look at this. Amen. And see, when I tell you this, now, I didn't, I didn't talk to Brother Arnold and say, God gave me a message for the Pentecostals at Gainesville. Uh, I pastored 45 years before I decided that, uh, of course, we evangelized a number of years as well. But uh, uh, in 45 years of pastoring and having preachers come through and, and listening, one of the things that sometimes irritated me the most was for somebody to call and say, I have a word for your church. Yeah. You know, I'm for it. I was for it. Right. And I had guys come in, and some of them did and some of them didn't. Right. Right. But when I tell you God give me a message for this church tonight, Amen. if you have any doubt, hang on a few minutes, all right? Amen. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 1. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there was a very there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I said O oh Lord God thou knowest and if we were talking in in Central Florida language, uh, Ezekiel would have said, God, I have no idea, but I'm sure you know. <laughs> Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, Oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Been there and done that, Brother Arnold. Yeah, yeah he knows. Brother Arnold knows. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld lo the sinews and, and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above and there was no, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds and O breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Would the church say amen? amen. You may be seated. Now, I could have quoted most of this, amen. and many of you could probably do the same here at church tonight. Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones. I said a moment ago, at this stage of my life, I am seeing more things come to light. Things that I took for granted. Some of the most simple stories in the Word of God are full of prophecy and power and promise to us. And we have been skimming over the top of a lot of this stuff for many, many years. I love it when God speaks to me. There is no greater time in my life than when the Lord says, tell the people I said. Tell the people this or that. That never fails. I mentioned a few days ago that in the first stages of my life, I took a church. Sister Shirley and I went out to evangelize when full time. When I was 21, we had served with my pastor before then. We went out uh, to evangelize at 21 years old. We evangelized three years. During that time, unbelievable things took place. I was from a, a North Florida, Pensacola, Florida. Attended the church that was very simple in its concept of a relationship with God. Spiritual gifts were not allowed. Of course, we're talking about now uh, more than, well, yeah, more than 50 years ago. Some of you folks may not realize this, but there was a time 
when spiritual operations were not permitted in the church unless it was in the pulpit and it was the pastor. Ministry of saints, I never heard of it in my life. It wasn't there, you know. We didn't recognize any other ministries in the church but the pastor. Uh, most of our pastors back in those days didn't even know what a staff was. They didn't even they didn't have an office in the church to to, to go and be alone with God or whatever. But it was a different time. And during that time, I began to seek God personally without even knowing what I was seeking God for. And during those times, God began to visit with me and give me insight to some things that, that was life-changing in my life. And He gave me some great sermons. Somebody said the other day, one of our preachers said, I have 2,000 sermons that I can preach from. I might have. I don't know. I never, I never took count or anything, Brother Arnold. But I'm not interested tonight in preaching you a sermon. We need to hear from God tonight. Hallelujah. And everything's going to be all right if we can do that. But anyhow, not long ago, I had a visitation of the Lord. And the Lord opened my understanding to something that, that really shot me and, and it's built and built uh, enormously since that time. And that was a, a visitation where God opened my understanding to the idea of third level relationship. And in the idea of third level relationship, he started off with one thing in the Word of God and it began to grow. And I had no idea how far this was going to go. Started with the tabernacle and I'm not going through that tonight. But the fact is, the more I read the Word of God over and over and over, God brought us back to the experience of third level relationship. Now I see you, uh, you folks are a little quiet when I said that because you may not have heard that just like that. But the fact is, the plan of salvation is third level relationship. Right? Repentance alone is not enough. Water baptism alone is not enough. You've got to have the whole process for it to work. Third level relationship. And many things, I could talk about many stories in the Word of God that prophetically dealt with the subject of third level relationship. The tabernacle was courtyard, sanctuary, holy of holies. That was third level relationship. But God dealt with me and it began to unfold. And just recently, the Lord brought my attention to this, this uh, prophetic story of Ezekiel and this valley of dried bones. Now, before I go any further, I hope tonight that I can change your mind about revival. Now, since Shirley and I went to Georgia, we had a, a church with about 25 people and every one of them. I don't know if anybody had the Holy Ghost. Praise God. But I was 24 years old and didn't know nothing. Haven't learned much in between after these years of pastoring. But uh, 24 years old and become a pastor. And we had great revival back in the, uh, in the 1970s. We were able to see more than 500 people at one time in that church. And we had revival. We had, we want a lot of people to God. And God decided to move us from there. We went to West Monroe, Louisiana and took a church with about 60 people and saw it multiply and, and we built it. There was nothing for us to see people get the Holy Ghost. We, we many times... Every, any, any service, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, to see 12, 15 people get the Holy Ghost. It was just God moved us into a level of a revival church. Now more than needing revival, just even for reaching the lost, you need to seek God to become a revival church. So that Wednesday night you can have miracles. 
Sunday morning, you can have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So, Sunday night, you can have... A, we don't just need that two or three times a year when an evangelist comes along. Now that they can come in and help. We're not opposed to that. But God help us become a revival church so that He's here all the time, any time. Amen! Amen! So when I say this tonight, I do not want to change your mind about praying for revival. That's not what this is all about. But revival is not the harvest. There's a difference in revival and the harvest. That's when we reach the world. That's when we reach the outside. Brother, I asked Brother Arnold a moment ago, how long had he been here pastoring 30, 34 years? You people, how many of you are still here when Brother Arnold first came here? Praise God. Just a few scattered hands. When you talk about revival, you have had, you have been in Holy Ghost revival 34 years. Amen. And along the way, the power and the anointing of your revival has affected people. And they've come in and were filled with the Holy Ghost. All right? Even a small portion of the harvest. But the fact is, revival is for you and not for the world. Because when you revive something... You're dealing with something that was alive and died and it's time to wake them up again. Get up and say, we need a move of God. You know what you've been doing for 34 years? You've been getting ready for the harvest. 34 years, I'm telling you. God said, you've been getting yourself ready for the harvest. Oh, hallelujah. Lord have mercy. Churches, I even take my son in St. Cloud, Florida, semi St. Cloud, that area, Orlando. He went there and he took a church and didn't have many people, 40, 50 people maybe. Been there, I think, eight years, something like that. And this has been one of the worst years of his life. Because there were people there when he went there that never, they, they never had any intention of living for God or moving up. All right? You can move into first level relationship. You see, in the tabernacle, there were three parts. There was the brass and the gold and the glory. All right? But what you people are asking for is not in the brass and it's not in the gold. It's in the glory. So I'm talking about getting ready for a time of visitation like you have never known before. Oh, come on, Pentecostals. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. when you were nothing but a bag of bones. He preached to you and he didn't settle for the noise. And he didn't settle for the movement. Are you hearing me? You know what we've done? We have confused. We have confused the anointing of God and the authority of God. We think that a shout and a dance and a run the aisle is a demonstration of the power of God. But it's not. It's not. It's a reaction to the power of God. And you haven't made it to the harvest yet. Are you listening? Don't think you got it made. Don't, you know, you've got one of the best churches in Pentecost. No doubt about that. You've got one of the best preachers.
preachers in Pentecost, no doubt about all that. You ain't there yet, baby. What I'm trying to tell you is, I don't know how many, I don't know how many people got the Holy Ghost this year in this church, brother Arnold. At least one. Praise God. Oh, I told the church this morning, we had this little old girl in our church back in West Monroe, Louisiana, want her mom and dad to God. And she was about 10 years old and she went away to a junior youth camp, came back and we were having all the children give a testimony. And this little girl, when it come her time, with a big grin on her face, she looked at that crowd and said, I got the Holy Ghost seven times this week. You like that? I'd rather hear some of you say, I got the Holy Ghost seven times this week. A shout and a dance and a run the aisle is not a demonstration of the power of God. It is a reaction. You want a demonstration of the power and authority of God? Let somebody jump up in the pew and say, I'm healed. said to you, every message God sends, He intends to confirm it with signs following. It's in the Word of God. I preached this morning and the pastor's wife was on her way to the hospital in severe pain. And the pastor was going to miss church. And they both decided, let's go to church. Just maybe God will give us a miracle. I preached the message God gave. And I said very clearly, Pastor Swag, I said God is going to heal you to confirm his word. Not me. That's very little to do with me. But I'm here to tell you today. We don't. I thank God for the shout. I thank God for preaching. I thank God. I like all of this. I'm in love with all of this. But I am ready to see a restoration of miracles, signs, and wonders, and the Holy Ghost falling on the crowd and the people that come into the house of God. I'm here to tell you tonight that many of you could easily stop right now with just some noise, with just some bones coming together. That was a revival, but it was only the first level of it, Brother Arnold. Are you listening to me tonight? I'm talking about Ezekiel didn't stop there. He went on to the next level. They needed some flesh and they needed some meat on those bones, if you please. So he prophesied and told flesh to gather on those bones. And flesh gathered on them and they were a great army, but they were breathless. Sometimes in my life, and I know pastor has, I have felt like I was just preaching to a vast multitude of people that was breathless. So you know what this man's been doing for 30 years, 34 years, he's been trying to get you to come together. Make some noise. Come together. Other places I went, I didn't even know what I was saying. I didn't know that revival is actually getting the church back together. Getting the church with flesh and life and bread so that when the harvest comes, we are ready. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. So Ezekiel had them all here with the bodies. Every, everyone that had died. Everyone that had been killed in the battle. And God said, Ezekiel, speak to the wind. 
Talk to what you can't see. And when that wind blew into that valley, God breathed on them. And when He breathed on them, they stood up. Breathing, living, heartbeat. And they were ready. Third level. They were ready. In the upper room, that 120 had been seeking God for days for God's promise of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And I'm talking about the breath of God that changes us from just being bones, just being bodies that are dead. Already. Amen. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to pump you up and just make you feel good. Because there's another part of this story. Because those of you that you felt like a little shaking and, and joining and getting together and rattling, you felt like that was enough. And some of you felt like just getting a little flesh back on those bones and that was enough. You know what he said about the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish? They that were ready went in. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap offering of praise. And over these years, God has sent you Macedonians from all over the United States of America to check you out. That still was not the harvest. That's just because of the, of the power and the authority. They were drawn in. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Joel had it all together. I listened to one of our leading preachers a few days ago say, the next great event is the sound of a trumpet and graves breaking open and the Lord taking His church out of here. It's not. It's not. If you believe that, you need to read the book of Joel. It won't take you very long. It's just three chapters. It'll just take you a lifetime to absorb it. Hallelujah. Joel said in the early church, he said, God has given you the former rain moderately. But in the last days, he is going to give you both the former and the latter rain in the first month. First month. Are you listening to me? What I'm trying to say is, you're not here tonight to get a good tingle in your flesh. You're not here to just feel good and wave your arms. You're not just here to give your tithe and be faithful to God. What I'm saying is, God is getting you ready through the man of God. He's getting you ready for the harvest. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, sir. There will be a day in order to handle the crowd out of Gainesville. He said in the last days, his house would be established on top of the mountain. All nations were going to flow into it. They're going to come from all over the state of Florida. Georgia, Alabama, or from other places because they're going to know, they're going to find out that Gainesville is ready. Gainesville is ready. Shake it off. Go ahead and act like it doesn't make any difference. But what I'm saying to you, that one day, oh, let me give you one. And this one I decided I would read it instead of just kind of pass it over. But one of the old stories that we've read about and preached about down through the years is in the book of Luke. And it goes something like this. And the Bible said, 
Then he said unto him, Luke chapter 14 verse 16, A certain man made a great supper. I never realized that was a third level prophecy for the last days. It is. Let me show you what happened. He sent out, he, the Bible said, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come! Come! All things are now ready! We are there! We are there! Not something that I think is going to happen 15, 20 years from now if I even survive that long. I'm talking about now. The signs of our day. The prophecies of our day. I thought it would happen in 2015. I really think it's going to happen in 2016. But if it don't happen in 2016, I'm telling you, we are still there. Alright. Listen to what happened. The Bible said he sent his servant out at supper time. Say to them, that were bidden. Right. Uh -huh. Everybody say, that's me. That's me. You were invited. Uh -huh. But you were not interested. Jesus. He could not get you up. Oh what if I were to tell you tonight that this man has saved all of you he can save, reached all of you he can reach. It's over with. It's just going to be those that have already decided that it's time for a move of God and revival. Now, it may not be tonight, but I'll tell you this. It will come soon. It'll come soon. And when it happens, it's going to happen without warning. The revelation of those ten virgins was that when the bridegroom came, and knocked on the door. Uh -huh. They that were prayed up, uh -huh. given up, right. faithful, right. obedient, loved the man of God, loved the word of God, loved God. Right. They that were ready went with him. Right. And the others said, We want to go to. First off, they said, give us some of your Holy Ghost. Give us some of your anointing. Give us, give us, give us some of what you, you got. You know, I, I really wasn't interested before tonight, but today I'm interested in give me some. And they said, We don't have enough. If the righteous scarcely be saved, we just don't have enough to give you some of it. And when they went to the church, hit the altar, there were so many. They couldn't get in the door. They couldn't park on the parking lot for people who decided they weren't ready yet. They wanted to have some more fun. They wanted to rule their own life a little more. All of a sudden now, they're ready to go pray. And when they got back, it was already over with. That's how fast it's going to happen. By the time you decide to get prayed through, get to where you need to go, it's going to be over. He said, Jesus said, I never knew you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We have an opportunity tonight not only to come together, make some noise, not only to look like real Pentecostal human beings, but we've got an opportunity to get some life. Breathe on me, Jesus. Joel said, sound the trumpet. Blow the trumpet. Sound an alarm. Hallelujah. Sound an alarm. I went into one of our Pentecostal churches not long ago and large church and there was probably 25, 30 people in the prayer room and I, I told them, I said you, I, now listen, I was raised Catholic so don't, don't think I'm criticizing you when I say this. I knew how to pray off of a rosary, brother. Whoever, yeah. 
everybody. I knew how to pray off of a rosary. You know, and uh, I did that, praise God. I did that. Until one day I found out I didn't have to pray like that. I could open my mouth and talk to him. Praise God. That was different. That was different. Ah, oh, hallelujah. But anyhow, these folks were mumbling. You know, just they were they were reading their Bibles and mumbling. And I had one of those crazy spirits, Brother Arnold, that you said he said, and I've seen him have some of those crazy spirits. Come on. Right. But I I walked through the prayer. Now the pastor said, I want you to help us. And so I tried. So I walked through that prayer room and I said, Come on, folks! Open your mouth! Pray out loud! Acting like somebody crazy, you know. And they did! They got started praying out loud. You could hear. In fact, you could walk in the lobby of the church and hear the people in the prayer room. We got up to over, well, way over a hundred people praying in the prayer room. They were rattling the, the walls of that place. Right. Hallelujah. Right. So the pastor said, I want you to teach the classes. I want you to go from class to class and I want you to teach on prayer. I said, wow, I can do that. Amen. And uh, we'd gotten up to Somewhere between four and five hundred people praying in West Monroe. Our prayer room architect said would handle five hundred, and we filled it up. And, and I didn't even have to talk about prayer, but and I mean, baby, you didn't go in there and carry on the conversation. You you would have had to have earplugs from person to person because it was noisy in the prayer room. We had miracles take place in the prayer room. People got the Holy Ghost in the prayer. Room, And so I taught prayer from class to class to class. Amen. Had one class, it was young adults from about, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 18 years old to 30 years old. Yes, and uh, we just had a great time. All right. The second time I walked into that class, taught it three times I think it was. Second time I walked into that class, there was a lady sitting there. She was on my left going to the pulpit to teach that night and she had a wheelchair parked right there by her chair yes. and uh, first time I, the first time I saw her I missed it I just spoke to her she told me she was Catholic that was the second time she'd ever first time she'd ever been in a, anything Pentecostal right. so I got acquainted and told her I was raised Catholic as well and wanted to be nice make friends and I got out of there and old as I am, if I could have kicked myself in the seat, I can't quite do it now like I used to. I said, God, why didn't I pray for that woman? She needed to be healed. And so the next time I walked into class, she was sitting there by, and her wheelchair was parked by her chair. And I walked over to her and I said, before I went to the pulpit, I said, Mom, I owe you an apology. She said, what for? I said, I should have prayed for you the last time I saw you and God would have healed you. Right. And she said, oh, wow, okay. I said, now, if I feel like praying for you tonight, will it be okay? She said, sure. And I started turning away and I said, if God healed you and you walk out of here, will you repent of your sins and get baptized in Jesus' name and let God fill you with the Holy Ghost? Tears start running down her face. She said, you better believe it, I will. So I taught the class that night. And when I got through, Brother Arnold, I walked over to her with her wheelchair parked there and I said, Mom, stand up. She couldn't. There were two men that went over and helped her stand up and she grabbed the chair in front of her to hold herself up. Her legs were too feeble. She was about 50 years old or mid-50s. And I said, tonight God is going to heal you to confirm what I preached, that God's going to let you know and these people know that I preached the truth here tonight sent from God. And the word was spoken and that Catholic grandmother walked out from between those pews and when she left that meeting, she was rolling that wheelchair in front of her as she went down the aisle. That Sunday morning, she walked up two flights of steps to the baptistry. They baptized her in Jesus' name and she come up out of the water talking in tongues as the Holy Ghost came to her. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is it's alright to shout. It's all 
in personal tonight. But people come to Gainesville not because they know you, but because they heard about him. And it's right because he has heard from God. Not just a preacher, not even just a good preacher, but a man of God. And I'm going to tell you something else. I believe the Holy Ghost has spoken to me. And that you're not about to die, buddy. And you're not about to get out of here. tonight with pain in your body and you were you were hurting and, and you just come on to church anyhow? Come here. Anybody? I'm not, this is no prayer line, okay? There's a reason for what I'm doing. I'm not stopping anybody from coming, but I'm not doing a prayer line, okay? I may have you sit and get to you later. Come here, Mom. You put your hand up and, and respond it quickly. Right. You're in pain right now? Is it personal? It's personal. So I'm not going to ask you to explain it to me. Don't need that, but I like sometimes to know what I'm praying for. All right. I don't know this lady. She probably don't even know me. It don't matter. But I'm here to tell you that God is going to heal you. I have said some heavy things here tonight. And God's going to heal you. Those of you that are sitting here tonight that are carnal and are weak, sleeping, 
slumbering. They all slept and slumbered. Brother Arnold has done a wonderful job of waking you up. And there are those of you that are ready to shout, ready to pray, ready to worship, ready to work, ready to do whatever God wants you to do. In that parable, only half of them made it. Only half. I believe more than half of this church is ready. Praise God. Lord, I want you to confirm what I have said tonight. Amen. Confirm your word by stretching forth your hand to heal. By the revelation of the authority of the name of Jesus, I heal I restore the health of these organs in the name of Jesus. I restore the health of this body in Jesus' name. I speak to you, pain. Go! tonight is the message I told you God sent you. Our relationship to God is in various levels. And there are at least three levels of your growth process. And that is the brass and the gold and the glory. Hallelujah. I asked God in a vision in the night. I said, God, why in a revival where people are getting the Holy Ghost and getting healed, why are people backsliding? Why are we losing people? They lose their interest in coming to church. And I said, God, I don't understand. And Lord God, he spoke to me in the night and he said, it is the routine that's killing my people. And they're backsliding over the routine. That's what, they, that's what they did once they got away from the brazen altar and the brazen lady. They went through the veil into the holy place. And inside the holy place was a table with bread. It was a 
golden censer, censer, or, or, uh, uh, a place for intercession where we take part of the insides. Quit giving God just a little mechanical response. Give Him something out of the inside. He wants to come up sweet, a sweet smelling over out of your inside. There was a table and the golden altar and there was a golden candlestick and every one of those articles of furniture is a long message of itself. But I'm here to tell you, in that sanctuary was nothing but gold. Everything was gold, overlaid with gold. And we have been shouting and jumping up and down for a generation because we've arrived in the gold. We've got illumination, revelation, light. We've got intercession. We've got preaching. You've had some of the best preachers at Pentecost come through this pulpit right here. Pastor is one of the, one of the top. You've had the best bread that the world knows nothing about. You've had it all. You know why you lose, you lose your joy and your relationship to God. You know why? That you lose your desire. As pastor said this morning. You know why we can't trust him. Like we ought to. Is because of the routine. We've lost. The value of the bread. We've lost the meaning. Of the light. We've lost the value of intercession. And it's now just a routine. Routine. Ooh. Hallelujah. And all the while, you know what some of you people, how many of you people are praying this prayer? God send us Holy Ghost revival. Anybody in this house praying that? That wasn't very many, brother. Harlan. And you got problems. Yeah. But you see, there was not one single promise in the gold. It was all a shadow a promise that there was no power or promise in the gold. And we have been wrapping ourselves up with the revelation of the gold and it wasn't even there. The Lord said, I, when I was crucified, He said, I opened the veil. So you could stand in the gold and look at the glory. And he's in, the, in the night, in a vision, God gave this to me and He said, My people have patched the opening in the veil between the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. They have patched that opening back with their flesh. And until they dig their flesh out of the opening, all they're going to do is march around the promise thinking they have arrived at the very conclusion of what I have to offer. And all the while, that great revival, that great uh, restoration, that great harvest, it's not in the gold, it's in the glory. Alright. I'm saying more than I even wanted to say tonight, but I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. There were three levels in that valley and army of bones. And you can stop at any level you want in the tabernacle or in the Ezekiel's valley of bones. I'm going to say this. Musicians can go to the instruments, please. But I'm going to tell you this. I always wondered why God sent Israel through 70 years exile and captivity. I, I just couldn't make that fit with most of the other numbers that I saw things that he did never really made sense. And then a few days ago, I know, I know Brother Arnold has, I have, I've read some of the books about what they call the, the Latin Rain movement back in 10 and 20 and 30. Let me tell you something. Back during that time, many of our great leaders and forefathers were born during that time. They came to truth 
in that time of great revelation. There was not a miracle that took place in the book of Acts that did not happen during that period of time. Un hundreds of people receiving the Holy Ghost. Hundreds of people. Uh, uh, brush harbors and old uh, street corners and all this stuff. And they had miracles unbelievable. They didn't have all the stuff we've got now with uh, uh, Obamacare, you know. You know, they, they didn't have social security maybe and, and a lot of things to help them. They had to depend on God. They had to trust God. So they did. I don't know what happened. But something happened. I believe, as it was with the revival in the early days, after 300 years of revival, apostolic revival like the book of Acts, and then they called together the Council of Nicaea, created a church today that we know is a false church spoken about in the book of Revelation. We know that. Then along come a man and he come up with the word uh, Trinity. It was born there in the Council of Nicaea, 325. And when they began to infiltrate Trinitarian doctrine into that apostolic revival, God took it. That's it. Right? All right? He took it. You know how long ago that was? Now, I thought that that revival listed, lifted about 1945. I thought. But then, a few days ago, I listened to Brother Stone King, and his opinion was that... When Israel become a nation in 1948, he said that's when the 70 years of the church being in exile will come to an end. So, did, did I say something that didn't make sense? Do you realize we've had miracle signs and wonders? We've had we've had great revival with hundreds of people getting the Holy Ghost. It's been gone for 70 years. We've been living in exile. Are you listening? Now, I see that and I believe that because the restoration is prophetically coming to pass right now. Starting to happen. But I'm here to tell you, get, this is what the Holy Ghost has said. Get yourselves ready. Get to the prayer room. Get your tithe called up. Don't play a fool in your bedroom by yourself with your literature and your books and magazines. and Get your life cleaned up. Because only they that are ready are going to go in to that visitation of God. And I believe Gainesville is a leader of that time of visitation. Let's stand to our feet. I kind of feel like what Bill Arnold said this morning. I'm, I really need some Holy Ghost filled men to come up here and I want you to walk out through the crowd. I'm not going to do it, but I, that's what I ought to do. And say, tell me how many is breathing. <laughs> they're standing up. They look like Pentecostals. They look like they're ready, but I want to know are they breathing? Because we need a Holy Ghost reviving. Yeah. Hallelujah. And revival is not for your lost kids unless they at one time knew God and left the church. That's revival. The harvest is almost upon you. And no church without a revival is going to be part of the harvest. Nobody. When the harvest starts, it's all going to be over with for your time to get ready. If, if the ten virgins, if that parable is right. I've said some more heavy stuff. Now somebody come here and let me pray for you. Is there any? No. Praise God. Come here, brother. Praise God. Are you sick right now? You're hurting in your stomach? In the name of Jesus. I take authority over these ulcers. I take authority over this attack on the stomach. I heal this condition by the authority in the name of Jesus. Be healed.
that's what you come for Thank for you. your husband. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God.
God gives a miracle, He does it for a purpose. Not only to heal the person, but to change their lives. All right? All right. Those of you that have come down here for prayer tonight, I want you, I want you to come stand here. All right? Hallelujah.